Stanley didn't like to travel uh, and he wanted to do this film here. I mean, most directors would have gone to the Philippines or do something like that. Well, that was not an option for him. It seemed to be a preposterous idea to make a Vietnam movie in East London, but Kubrick had a bunch of reasons for shooting his films in, in England, the principal one being that he didn't like to do anything more than 10 miles from his house. The last time Stanley left England was to go to the premiere of 2001 in New York, and then he sailed. One of the biggest reasons he did the film was because there was this gas works, this abandoned gas works in East London called Beckton, and they were about to destroy it. But it had the same or very similar French architecture to the city of Way. And uh, we got the permission to topple buildings because it was derelict anyway. That hasn't been used since after the First World War. Anton First, who was the designer on it, just went round the place and said, well, if we, if we cut away these pillars on this building, it'll fall over on its side, sort of thing. And, and hey, presto, they did. And, and, and the building, sure enough, fell over. You know, it was, it was fairly straightforward. A apparently, it was quite hairy when they were doing it. The story goes that Stanley wanted to dynamite some of them, but they, they wouldn't let him. And what he would do is, in order to, to make it look even more like Vietnam, he flew in a bunch of palm trees. By adding the palm trees, you really did get the sense of it very quickly that you were over there. And I think they did a tremendous job because most people don't believe that this was all done in East London, of all places, yeah. Fucking bored to death, man. I gotta get back in the shit. I ain't heard a shot fired in anger in weeks. During the filming, I asked, how's this gonna go? This is gonna go slowly. And it was something none of us were used to. I don't think you can make films as well as Stanley does without taking that long. I just don't think you can. Originally, I was hired for 18 weeks, and of course, I knew it wouldn't be 18 weeks. It never is. I think he hires everybody for 18 weeks, and then <laughs> it just goes over and over. I believe it was about 17 months. I was brought in on the very first day, and I left on the very last day. Four months longer than tour of duty. It wasn't going to be the short time tour of duty. It was going to be, you know, potentially years off your life. And he was going to put you through hell, you know, in his own inimitable way. You just didn't know when it was going to end. It was mainly around the sequence where uh, Eight Ball and the Doc get shot by the sniper. I know that Dorian stayed laying in the mud for a very long time. We're on that wall for a month doing that scene. From the time we arrive to the time we all get across. That sequence kept us pinned down, literally, because every time they blasted the sides of the buildings, all the bullet hits had to be reset, and it took them about two or three days to reset all the bullet hits. The concussive effect that I got from those buildings, I had never experienced. And I had earplugs in, the whole thing, but just the explosions were so powerful that they would pound into my, into my eardrum. And I could only imagine what the real sound of real guns close range, real bombs, and those things were like. All the actors, I think, were, to a man, very, very brave, because Stanley put them through it. He really did. The more that the actors are thinking, you know, when is this going to end, the more like the guys in Vietnam they become. None of this is lost on Stanley. He knows what he's doing, a very, very clever crafter of actors' psyches. And I'll always remember what he said to me. In the, in the early going, and he said it to me, it was his mantra to me, the whole shoot. He said, Adam, you know, Adam, you're just not patient. I'll never forget that. The impression I had about him was that he was 99% visual, and I didn't think he knew that much or cared that much about acting, and I was wrong about that, because he did have a great eye for, for acting. Stanley likes actors that show up know their lines and don't bump into the furniture. And he doesn't want to hear anything else. He doesn't care about the motivation. He cares about it in the way that it better be right to tell his story properly. But he doesn't want to talk about it. Show up, know your lines, don't bump into the furniture. Basically, that's it. 
He doesn't want to explain to an actor what he's looking for. He's already cast you. And anything you bring is good enough for him if it tells his story properly. If it doesn't, he'll say, do it better. Do it more interesting. He does use those terms. Doesn't say how to do it, what to do. You fucked up, do it again. He'll say it right to you, right in front of everybody. No problem. You talk the talk. Do you walk the walk? Whoa. At one point, Adam did his line. Stanley said, cut, OK, let's do it again. And Adam said something to the effect of, oh, man, what, did, you know, what does he want? As soon as he said this, there was a quick silence because he's saying it, and, and the great Stanley Kubrick. And Stanley kind of leaned over from his camera. How about better acting? And then he comes back over, <laughs> and we all just like, whoa! Although everybody used to think Stanley was very precise about his filmmaking, he used to experiment a lot more than people realized. And at one point, he got all of the main cast together, and he brought us into his motorhome, and he says, you know, I'm not sure how I want to end this film. You guys have any ideas? <laughs> we all look at each other. Stanley Kubrick's having, asking us how we should end the, his film. In the script, and I believe it's still in my copy of the script, Animal Mother cuts the head off the, the sniper and throws it out of the building. Animal Mother had been carrying a machete on his back the whole show in order to do this one little thing. And so after... Joker administers could grow. He wastes her and like it's oh it's some big important thing that we've wasted this little gook sniper. And Animal Mother takes umbrage at that saying, it's not that important. He peels out his machete and lops off her head and picks it up. You know, they're all celebrating Joker and Animal's like, here's the head. That's not a big deal. That's hard. That didn't make it into the film for reasons that Stanley never told me. It was too horrific, and unnecessarily so. Stanley was not out to, to do something sensational that is particularly horrible. He was always conscious of violence in his films. I talked to him about Clockwork Orange, which he always felt he'd overdone the violence, and that's why he had the control in England to, to ban it, and he banned it. After the movie was over and you know, I was being interviewed about the movie, and I said in a complimentary way that Stanley was a perfectionist. And Stanley called me from England. He called my house. I'm not a perfectionist. I'm not a perfectionist. Why did you say I'm a perfectionist? I said, Stanley, you are a perfectionist. What do you think all those takes are? Stanley could spot a, a fly flying through the background of his movie at 100 yards and cut, back up, let's do it again. I think the average was at least 30 takes. Yeah, maybe more. I stopped counting. Slower, louder, faster. Again, again, again. Let's see what he does. Let's beat him down. Let's see what happens. The most takes that we ever did uh, with me. Holy Jesus. What do we have here, Private Powell? What is this, Private Powell? What the hell is this, Private Powell? What the fuck is that? What is that, Private Powell? Sir, a jelly donut, sir. A jelly donut? Sir, yes, sir. 30 some takes. We got it. You are a disgusting fat body, Private Powell. Sir, yes, sir. Most actors who have to shout a lot on a scene will hold back their voice a bit in rehearsals to try and maintain enough voice for the, for the performance because Lee gave it rock all from the moment he started, you know, and as a result, his voice just broke down. Lee was put through a lot of takes and held up. You know, his voice uh, was, was really very hard for Lee. His voice went out on him a lot. And the way I see it, ladies, you owe me for one jelly donut. Now get on your faces. The thing I remember most about the Full Metal Jacket experience is Stanley Kubrick. He was a one of a kind person. And I was a student of Stanley Kubrick during that film. The only thing I can say about making a film with Stanley was you worked harder, I think, for Stanley Kubrick than any other director you worked for. He was a, 
A difficult man, there's no two ways about it, he was very difficult at times. There were times when you'd gladly strangle him, but there were other times when you'd walk over broken glass to work with him. You know, you really would. He was the most patient man that I've ever met, and yet he could be the most impatient of tyrants behind the camera when he was ready and you weren't. People said of Kubrick in another world he would have been a general in an army. We were driving in Stanley's wife's SUV. Nice, brand spanking new, beautiful SUV. Somehow, Stanley talked her out of it that day. And we're looking for a place to do a scene. And Stanley's driving. That's how one track minded Stanley was. He was driving and he was pointing. He was saying, Doug, you see that? We're going to set the troops up over here and we're driving. And in the meanwhile, I'm sitting there watching us drive slowly into a ditch and the ditch is about six foot deep. Stanley drove, as he talked, he drove off into this ditch, and the car went over on its side. Stanley reached up, undid his seatbelt, he reached up and he pushed the door open, and he climbed, <laughs> climbed out of the SUV, and he climbed up on top, and he's still talking. And we'll, we'll, we'll put up the tent over here, and, and we're gonna have, we'll, we'll have base camp over here. Uh, Doug, get up here. And then he jumped off the side of the SUV and started walking down the road back toward base camp and looked back and said, well, come on. And we're all standing on the side of this SUV saying, do you believe this shit? Hey, it's Lisa now. Oscars are handed out to recognize the work of actors, cinematographers, producers, and other individuals who play a role in the development of a movie. Now, James Cameron's Titanic swept the 1998 Oscars with 11 wins. But some might be surprised to know that Titanic has the same record amount of Academy Awards as The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, and 1959's Ben-Hur. Now, click here below to subscribe, and remember to also tap the bell to always have our videos in your feed.